Well, our subject this evening is the rights and wrongs of boasting. The rights and wrongs of boasting. And the text from which we make this study is in Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 23. Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Now the thoughts there of glorying, let not the wise man glory or the mighty man glory or the rich man glory are synonyms for boasting. And we're thinking then about rights and wrongs of boasting. Now no one likes a boaster. In fact, we tend to get turned off by those who like to tell us what great things they've done, the important people they've met, the possessions which they have, and value highly. And there are some people who just love to talk about themselves and give you their history. And even though you might interject with something that in a conversation might relate to what they have, they come back to themselves again and they find themselves speaking just about themselves. And we find it very difficult sometimes. They also th think about the possessions they have, which they value highly. I had an uncle once who was a Christian, he's in heaven now, but he liked to boast a little about things. But one day he calmly told me, David, I'm no swank, but actually he loved to talk about the things that he did. Well, we find such people difficult because they often make us have a reaction with our own souls. We begin to feel jealous and we begin to feel resentful if we're not careful as believers. We don't have perhaps what they have, makes us feel a bit lower in their estimation. And of course, this is human nature. It's part of the experience of being human beings. And so Jeremiah has something to say about this in this 23rd verse. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. But it was God who said this. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory or boast in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man boast in his might, and let not the rich man glory or boast in his riches. And so the prophet Jeremiah, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, puts his convicting finger on us, not just on the boasters, but because we have the same capacity to do what the boasters do, we need to think about them ourselves today. But let's think of it in three parts because it divides very easily into that. First of all, we think about wise people who boast about their wisdom. Now, people of the world just love to think about themselves as very wise. And you could listen to them and they'll say things like, well, if you ask me, I think that, and their opinion will tumble out. And it may be that you haven't asked them, but they, they, they'll tell you anyway. Or they'll say, if you want my opinion, then I think the government ought to do this. And you find them saying with great authority that they know better than others. And there's a massive increase in counselling of all kinds these days. People go to those whom appear to them to seem to be wise people and can probably help them with their problems. These are those people who set themselves up as consultants, that they have some wisdom in some area of their experience or of their studying, or in business or in management, and they invite people to go to them for pearls of wisdom. And then there are those who are called advisors. There's financial advisors, insurance advisors, management, health advisors, you name it, there's an advisor that there is available to you. And they will have at their fingertips the very advice and the very need that you have of their wisdom. Now, of course, advisors and consultants are not all boastful. They do provide a service, and I'm not saying they're all boastful, but it is an example of some who will set themselves up as something 
special. And you may recall the man Job, who suffered a great trial, who came through it with God's help, never blaming God for one moment. But he had a set of so-called friends and advisors around him, called the friends of Job. And inaccurately, they're called Job's comforters. And they, during the narrative, as we read it in the book of Job, said some very hurtful things to this poor suffering man. But in their eyes, they were wise sayings. And Job replies to them at one point in chapter 17 and verse 10, But as for you all, do ye return and come now, for I cannot find one wise man among you. So-called wise people boast about their wisdom. And yet the wisest people are those who do not for one moment think that they are wise. They've discovered something very special. Again in Job 28. Unto man he said, Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to de de depart from evil is understanding, as we read earlier. There is, however, a righteous kind of boasting. We've looked at the unrighteous thought and the, perhaps the unhelpful thought, but there's a righteous kind. And this kind of boasting is for the follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Christian man or woman or young person. And Jeremiah again points us in the right direction. In the next verse, in this couple of verses, verse 24, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment or justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Now the Christian can boast. Yes, the Christian can indeed boast, but only about the mercy and the forgiveness of God which has been shown through the precious work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because real wisdom of which the Christian can rightly boast is understanding and knowing God himself in the Lord Jesus Christ. There are things we can boast about. We certainly cannot boast about our works. Paul says that in Ephesians 2. For it is by grace we are saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, but it is of God, and it's not of works, in case, in case we should boast, in case we should say, I've saved myself. No, we're quite clear from the New Testament scriptures where the credit lies for our conversion and our Christian lives. And then we can boast of deliverance. We sang about it earlier from Psalm 34, of his deliverance I will boast, till all that are distressed from my example comfort take, and calm their souls to rest. So there are things we can boast in. But for believers, it's a joy to be able to jo boast of this wisdom in our minds and in our hearts that the Lord Jesus Christ has put there by his Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord Jesus dwells in our hearts. And as Proverbs says, and Proverbs 8 particularly, when it speaks of wisdom, we can look at the Lord Jesus Christ and see him as the wisdom spoken of there our Saviour and Lord. He is the most wise person that ever lived in a human body. But hear what Solomon, the man endowed with superb wisdom, had to say in Proverbs 8. Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice? She standeth on the top of the high places, by the way in the places of the paths. She crieth at the gates, at the entry of the city, and the coming in of the doors. O you, unto you, O man, I call. Again, we see the person of Christ here calling us to know him and to know his word. Unto you I call, O man, my voice is to the sons of man. O ye simple, understand wisdom. And ye fools, be ye of an understanding heart. Receive my instruction, and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. Now Solomon goes on to identify wisdom with God himself and the Lord Jesus Christ later on in Proverbs 8, 
Verse 22, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. Before his works of old, I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest parts of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. This is Jesus Christ speaking the wisdom of God. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth. Then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth. And my delights were with the sons of men. And then Solomon says this, Hearken unto me, O ye children. Blessed are they that keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise and refuse it not. Blessed is the man that hears me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. For whoso findeth me, findeth life, and shall obtain favour of the Lord. Now our relationship and our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that he has saved us and come into our lives and moved powerfully within us and changed us so that we are new creatures, now that is something wise to boast about. Because we're not boasting about ourselves, we're boasting about him who has done a great work within us. Rejoicing in Christ our Saviour, being found in him by grace. That's the wisest thing that any man or woman can do. But Solomon finishes the eighth chapter with these words of warning. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul, and they that hate me love death. Well, so much for wisdom. Wisdom. But Jeremiah has said something more about boasting. Glorying in wisdom, glorying and boasting in wisdom of Christ. But what about strength? Because secondly, strong people, they tend to boast about their strength. Thus saith the Lord God, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither the mighty man glory or boast in his might. Now I'm sure you've come across people who love to throw their weight around. Not necessarily physically, but by the very presence of their personality. You'll find bombastic people, bullying and self-assertive people who barge in here and interfere there. They not only boast in loud, self-opinionated terms, but also push hard that everyone else sees things their way. Goliath, the Philistine champion, fell into this category. He defied the armies of the living God with his words, roaring out every day, challenging the living God and challenging Israel to find a champion to come and fight him. But cha his challenge was towards the Lord God. And he was boasting in his strength. He taunted and he mocked and he boasted about his great weight, his great height and how strong he was as the giant. And like the builders of the Titanic, he believed that he was unsinkable, that he was invincible, he was unstoppable, until David, the Lord's servant, came along. Then there was the king of Syria besieging Samaria, who had the temerity to send hefty and boasting letters, boasting of the strength that he has, as he was saying how strong he was and how weak the people of Samaria were and how utterly helpless and hopeless they were with this letter. And some believed it, and their faith failed within the city of Samaria. Others believed God, it's recorded in 2 Kings 6 and 7, because the result was that as the people trusted God, that all the might of Syria evaporated when God sent the noise of chariots, and they scattered and they left, where was their strength then? Now in modern times we hear of Eastern European threats to peace. 
And yesterday's news of a Ryanair plane being threatened by a fighter plane and being forced to divert to Minsk in Belarus so that an activist on board could be arrested. And the president of Belarus, President Lukashenko, seems to have the power to do such things and is boasting in his strength with many other things that he's doing in his country. Just an example of glorying in might. And we, the ordinary people, feel very small and very insignificant when we think of the world scene. And we could replicate that situation over and over again in many parts of the world. But we need not fear at all. And Jeremiah encourages us. Let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, would exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, where in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Now our almighty God hath the greatest power that is known to man. But in some cases it isn't known to man. For there are people who do not believe in the Lord God. They believe in other things. They even seek to raise up power in other things, even in idols. And in the secular things of the world in which they think they have power. But the Lord God has great power, absolute power to do just as he please. He after all has created all things and he keeps that creation going day after day. And so for the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, real strength is to know God's strength in the Lord Jesus Christ, his strength. Paul says, when he writes to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 1, And to them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Well, if only these world rulers and leaders knew, and if only we ourselves truly knew where the real power and the real strength lies in our world, then we would fear nothing. Our powerful, strong God is on our side. Moses told the children of Israel three times in Exodus 13 and verse 3, Remember this day in which ye came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out. From this place, from, a, from with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. And then verse 16, For by strength of hand the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt. Three times he is saying the strength of the Lord brought two million people out of Egypt in a miraculous way. And we think about the Exodus, we think about the record of it in the book of Exodus and the remarkable and miraculous way that Israel were released from the bondage of being in that terrible country of Egypt. And it was by strength of God's hand, not their own, but God's hand alone that did that. And he commemorated this, did Moses, in his song. Exodus 15, the Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. One of uh, our favorite verses is from Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. And we can think of examples of strong towers. We can think of the uh, uh, castles that we have in this country. We have the Tower of London. We have uh, Arundel Castle, it's huge great battlements, we can think of a strong tower. We can also think of little broths in Scotland where the people ran to for safety. Think of a, a Moorish castle in Gibraltar that has survived for 700 years and was part of the embattlements there and the casements there in Gibraltar. There are so many places that illustrate that the name of the Lord is a strong tower to which we can run. We know God's mighty power in our lives. 
Has he come and demonstrated his power to us? Can we look back at occasions in our lives when he has been our strength, when we have felt weak, when we have felt desperate and desolate, and he has come with his strength and encouraged us, and he has rescued us, and then he's rescued us from that ultimate danger of eternal punishment. So many people around us at the moment are heading for a, a Christless eternity in hell, and he has rescued us by his strength because we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We earned the right to go to hell, but he has rescued us from it through the blood of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is strength indeed. His strength is made perfect in weakness and we can know the strength of God. And we have that assurance in the gospel. This is the strength which we need to know. Real Christians rejoice in this strength of God Almighty in Christ Jesus. So let not the wise man boast in his wisdom or the strong man boast in his strength. But thirdly, we find in this text that rich people tend to boast about their wealth. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, says Jeremiah, because this is another area of boasting, which is in the area of how much of the world's wealth a person has. You look it up. The richest man on earth at the moment has $186 billion to his name. And you can look at the top ten if you want to. You really want to think about these things, but what does it mean to be rich in this world's good? The son of the Sultan of Brunei, the world's richest monarch today, some years ago threw a birthday party for himself, inviting famous people from all over the world to join him. And this is some years ago, but the bill for that party was seven million pounds. Enough today to be, build a medium-sized hospital in our country. And this Sultan's son justified the expense by saying out of his $1.2 billion fortune, then a mere seven million was not very much to pay. And just that very action is a rich man boasting in his riches, glorying in his riches. Now unbelieving people love to show off their wealth. Often they do it rather subtly. They make sure that you overhear them talking about the value of shares they hold or invite you to see one of, round one of their homes or give you a lift of one of their special cars. Oh my friends, the Bible has many warnings about the boastfulness associated with wealth. Psalm 49, they that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceaseth for ever. No, riches do nothing for the preservation of the soul of a man or a woman. Only the riches of Christ can do that. Proverbs 10 verse 2, Treasure, Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivereth from death. That is, Christ's righteousness. The Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish, but he casteth away the substance of the wicked. And riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from death. The Lord Jesus himself warned this in Matthew 16. What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And we need to know that real wealth is to know the Lord Jesus Christ and to be an heir of the riches of God which will come when Christ returns or takes us to glory. We thought much about that in our studies on Sunday evenings here at Wooden Valley in the first chapter of the letter of Peter, the first Peter, we taught about the inheritance that we can look forward to. And it fills our hearts not only with hope but a certain and sure knowledge that we have so much to 
inherit one day through knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour, who is the most fabulously wealthy person in the whole universe. He's the maker of it all, he owns it all. And we belong to him as his children. Children's chorus. I'm richer than a millionaire just because he cares. No more poverty, no more despair. I'm going to a mansion he has promised to prepare. Now that's something to boast about. So as I've said, the word for boasting is glorying here in this text. What was it that Jeremiah said to us in our text? Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, nor the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth, him that boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Yes, God delights in righteousness. The righteousness of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That righteousness that is miraculously imputed to us, that is, accounted to us ordinary sinful people. Righteousness of Christ is given to us. And God delights in that righteousness. Gloriously displayed in the Lord Jesus Christ, which is why we worship him, our Saviour. We owe everything to him. Our sins have been forgiven. We praise him for his forgiveness and his pardon and his goodness to us the gift of faith that he has given us, now we are able indeed to boast of that goodness and thank him for his mercy. And we can say along with Paul as he wrote to the church at Galat in the Galatian region, God forbid that I should glory, God forbid that I should boast save except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. What do we have to boast about, my brothers and sisters? We'll sing it in a moment, but John Stocker writes in his hymn, Thy mercy, O God, is the theme of my song, the joy of my heart, and the boast of my tongue. We can boast in mercy, for it has been shown to us. Mercy is not something that is earned, it is something that is given. And God has shown us great mercy and we can boast of it. We can boast of it to others and say, God has been merciful to me, a sinner. I didn't deserve it, but he has shown it to me. So we rightfully boast of the mercy we have found. And Joseph Grigg also in his hymn, Till then, nor is my boasting vain. Till then, I'll boast a saviour slain. Yes. We can boast, we can glory, but so long as it is directed towards the Lord Jesus Christ and gives him the acknowledgement and the honour, yes, and the glory, it would be in vain. But when we put him first, in every aspect of our lives and our worship, then he gets the credit and the boasting is legitimate. That is the right boasting. May God bless his word to our hearts this evening.